first afternoon speaker today is Paul Kirk, who will talk about Lagrangian for theory for traceless as you do care to varieties of patterns. Well, thank you, and thank you for the organizers for uh, inviting me. It's my first time in Russia, and if all of Russia is as beautiful as St. Petersburg, and I, I wish I had come soon. Uh, so I'm going to talk about this. Uh, in, in the United States, the, we have a theory as to why Russian mathematicians are so good, and the theory is that um, their seminars are like two or three hours long, and, and um, and so I prepared a two or three hour long lecture. Uh, <laughs> uh, so when I have one minute left, please tell me and then I'll just click through the last. Uh, and, and, so, and so what's on the board here is, is part of what it will come up here on the slides, but maybe you'll forget if I go too fast and so you'll be able to refer to the notes. Okay, so I want to talk about some work mostly in, pro in progress, mostly with Hedden and Carol, uh, it's a big project and we're, it's hard to predict, but maybe we're halfway done through it. I hope to um, indicate to you that there's some interesting ideas here. Um, <clears throat> let me go to the very end of my talk so that maybe this won't make sense, but maybe it will tell you something about um, what the talk is about. So here's a picture of a, a two-sphere. It's a singular two-sphere. It has four points in it. Uh, it's a two manifold, so it has, well, so it has a symplectic structure. I may not emphasize this point. And in this two manifold, I have two uh, immersed Lagrangian sub manifolds. So one of them is brown, it's this figure eight, this immersed circle. The other is green. Um, this puncture two sphere, I, I, I'm going to represent it in several ways during this talk. The easiest way is to think of it as taking a square, a uh, rectangle, identifying this edge with this edge, <coughs> this edge with this edge, and this edge with this edge. I've indicated that over here, and I'll come back to this in a second. So these are all three of the same pictures. And um, so at the end of the talk, if, I, if you stay here, and if I'm allowed to speak for three hours, what you'll understand is that um, this picture gives rise to a chain complex, a Z mod four grade ch uh, chain complex over the field of two generators. It has eight generators given by the intersection points of the green curve and the um, brown curve. So like Q, S, T, R, these are all intersection points. So they're, it's Z mod four graded. So this is to indicate that it has rank two, the chain complex has rank two in grading zero, rank two and grading one, rank two and grading, these are generators. And then it turns out that there's some differentials that can be read from this picture by looking for immersed bygones. And in this case, you see there's a bygone here. It's a disc that has one of its edges along the green line and one of its edges along the brown line. And such a, such a this particular disc tells us that this chain complex has uh, the differential of Q is Q. And so the homology, when you, um, when you work it out, you see that the homology has rank one in each uh, grade. And then, of course, uh, I'll have to tell you why this has something to do with the 4 7 torus knot, uh, what it has to do with. Sorry, how is this the first homology? Uh, what is the order of the homology? It's Z mod 4 graded. So there are four groups, um, and uh, now I'm only showing you a small piece of the 4-7 torus knot. There, there are more green curves, and I didn't want to clutter the picture. So when you're done, it will turn out that there'll be. I want to describe a potential invariant of knots, which, when calculated for the 4-7 torus knot, will give this answer. This answer coincidentally agrees with the all-known conjectures about instanton homology. Uh, another uh, important invariant, Hagar Fleur homology. And, uh, and then there's, a, there's sort of a picture emerging in these Fleur theories that um, A, they're all isomorphic, so I'd like to say that we're attempting to produce a different model for some, some as yet un, not understood or not uh, understood uh, theory. 
And all, but one feature that all these theories have is that when you apply them to not in S3, they always come with a spectral sequence that starts the T2 term as covenant homology, and it limits to whatever the theory is. So those are, the, those are the ingredients of what I want to talk about. I probably won't be able to tell you everything, but at least if this, you know, if I stop one third of the way through my talk, this is where I would have gotten to be. Uh, just some, some brief uh, context uh, to put it. So I'm interested in, in some of the three plus one TQFTs that have been around since, uh, since the Chern-Simons function being prominent. Uh, and, you know, the, most of the kind of TQFTs that have been discussed in this conference are those that arise out of Witten's um, use of a, a, fine, a path integral with Chern-Simons as the Lagrangian, as the action. Uh, but there's another thing you can do with the chern simons function, and that is to <coughs> consider it as a Morse function on a manifold and look at the Morse homology. So that gives rise to something called instanton homology. Um, so I presume most people have seen this before. This is the space of connections on some principal bundle of a three manifold. This is a, a particular uh, number associated with any such connection. It's an integral of a given three form on the three manifold. And the importance of this function is that its critical points can be identified with the moduli space of flat connections that we've seen already a few times in this conference. And, um, and then uh, if, you're trying to, if you're trying to generalize the idea of the Morse homology uh, of, for example, finite, <coughs> the finite dimensional Morse theory, you would start with a manifold and a Morse function on it. And you would construct a chain complex whose generators are the critical points of the function. And the way you define differentials is by looking at gradient flow lines that start at one critical point and end at another critical point. So uh, the same can be done in this infinite dimensional setting. It turns out that the critical points, may perhaps once you mod out by some uh, gauge group or group of equivalences, <coughs> the flat connections. And the differentials, the gradient flow lines, are actually instantons on a given format. So they satisfy, they satisfy. These are both nonlinear uh, partial differential equations on the manifold M. And uh, so it's kind of a difficult theory. And what I want to talk about is perhaps a more topology friendly uh, construction of, of this theory. So it's difficult. This idea has been around since Fleur came up with it. Um, 25, 30 years ago, and uh, it's been, there are variations on it, and there's a very uh, interesting variation on it that Fleur hinted at um, when he was thinking about this, but that's been successfully carried out by Kronheimer and Mopka. And it's very technical. It involves uh, the study of connections on a three-manifold that have some sort of prescribed singularity along a co-dimension two sub-manifold. So um, they have a, a particular, um, they don't extend to smooth connections over the link or not in the manifold, and, but they fail to extend to smooth connections in a particular controlled way. And what that enables us to do is to, is to promote this theory from a theory of just closed manifolds to a theory that associates some kind of homology to a manifold with a link inside. And that turns out to be a very uh, helpful, and although it's technical, it turns out to be more accessible because once you once you can put a, a link inside your manifold, uh, there are many technical issues that can be uh, resolved using that construction. Okay. Um, again, I'm, you should read this, and if it doesn't make any sense to you, it's okay. It won't be necessarily relevant to what I uh, say. Um, but um, instanton homology is defined by Kronheimer and Rufka for a three manifold and the link inside is whenever, it's a very difficult to compute, but the few computations that exist show it to be isomorphic to um, a, a very important and useful invariant now in low dimensional topology, namely uh, the not Hagar theory. Now, Hagar Fleur theory has been recently proved by Taubes and his collaborators equal another version of Fleur homology, which is cyber witness Fleur homology. And so, at least to, to, it appears, you know, that there's a, there's, we're in a period in mathematical history akin to when, say, homology was introduced um, 100 years ago, you know. There were different models for homology. Some applied in certain contexts of different constructions. 
And finally, we know with, uh, through Eilenberg and uh, Steenrod's work that these all ended up being uh, sort of different versions of the same thing. And uh, that's a believe, it's believed that these uh, floor theories that, that have been constructed all have a similar property. I'm going to describe another theory that perhaps isn't yet completely defined, but has all the same properties. And, and in, in every known calculation agrees with these. But it's much trivial, much more simple to compute than these two. There's no, there's no PDEs, there's no, in fact, you can even avoid pseudo-homorphic disks. We can just talk about immersed disks and two manifolds. Um, anyway, so that's the, the topic of the talk. Um, so uh, the, the important ingredient is, uh, as I said, that the critical points of the church science functions are flat connections. When you're talking about singular connections, it turns out that the, uh, the relevant space of flat connections is what we call the traceless character value, which I've defined right here. And um, I will define it again in, in a second. And uh, these traceless character varieties have some nice properties. One that we've already seen, I think, in the first day in, in uh, uh, Alexiev's talk, was that there's a symplectic structure on the, these traceless character varieties associated to the two-sphere. One thing I will show you is that there's a Lagrangian immersion associated to a three-manifold whose boundary is a two-sphere. So there are Lagrangian immersions. And uh, the intersections of these two Lagrangian immersions, if you start with the decomposition of a three-manifold along the two-sphere, will give us the corresponding critical set of the trend signs. So here's a picture that's associated to a decomposition of a three-manifold containing a knot and a link. And it's a picture that's familiar in another version of Fleur theory, namely Lagrangian Fleur theory, which studies chain complexes associated to symplectic manifolds and Lagrangian subnet. So it's similar to the K2 the R and 2 yeah, K2, yeah. Now, uh, from, from, my, uh, from my perspective, one of the most interesting parts of this story, and in fact the most technical part, and I will almost say nothing about it, has to do with the fact that the varieties in this picture that I will describe and I'll give you some pictures of tend to be singular. And so there's a desingularization process that's needed. And uh, this, there's, a, there's a known way to do this. This is called holonomy perturbation. I will sweep this under the rug, although in fact that to me is where, is where the mystery and in fact the beauty of this subject comes in. But I, I, it would be technical and I, I think I'm going to. I, I'll go give you some pictures and some flavor of what it is, but I probably won't be precise with what those perturbations. Okay, so let's let's start at the beginning. This is perhaps if you've understood nothing I said, you can, uh, you can tune in again. Uh, SU2 is a group, I will think of it as a group of unit quaternions. And in this manifestation, the traceless unit quaternions are the ones for which uh, the real part is zero. So they form a two sphere in SU2, which is a three sphere. And um, now here's the main object the main definition for this talk. If I have a compact n-manifold and a co-dimension 2 sub-manifold, then I want to look at the homomorphisms from the complement of the link into SU2 that take every meridian, that is to say, any loop which, which uh, goes near the link and then goes once around and comes back, to uh, into the, this particular conjugacy class. This is a conjugacy Trace, being trace zero is a conjugacy invariant condition. So this is the uh, subset of, of all homomorphisms that satisfy this extra condition. And the mod out by conjugation, two homomorphisms are equal if one is G rho G inverse times zero. It's not hard to see that this is a compact, real algebraic variety. Compactness is easy because it, it follows from the fact that SU2 is compact. Real algebraic is just a given by polynomial equation. Um, it can be singular for two reasons. One, the polynomial equations that cut it out may have singularities. 
but two, we're modding out by the action of conjugation, and so there may be some fixed points of that action. So it can be singular in two ways. That's a source of difficulty in this subject, uh, but there are ways to deal with it, and in fact, this, some of these ideas that Kronheimer and introduced enable us to deal with those in very efficient ways, and that's what sort of enables us to, to uh, pursue this line. Okay, let's look at let's look at one family of examples. It's a, it's a kind of example that we've already seen in this in this uh, conference. So the the manifold in question will be a two sphere. The co-dimension two manifold will be a collection of two n points, which I'll uh, I'll label those points a one b one through a n b n, and then maybe the loop that goes around a one I'll call it capital a one. The loop that goes around b one I'll call it capital b one. So here's the fundamental group of the complement of two endpoints in the sphere. Now I'm interested in this traceless character variety. So what I should do, I think most of us are familiar with the fact that this group, this is a, a funny way of writing a free group on two n minus one generators. That is to say, you could bring everything except bn to one side of the equation, and you see that bn can be expressed in terms of the previous generators. And so the free group, free groups are fairly easy to understand their representation variety, but the traceless condition that we want here actually complicates things. So here's a theorem I, I ascribe it to folklore um, because I first saw it in a paper of XS Lin when he uh, introduced his invariant to the signature invariant uh, in terms of character varieties. But he states as without proof, and it's not hard, it's, an, it's, a, it's a fairly simple exercise. The theorem is that um, this is a uh, real algebraic variety. It has two strata. So, so it's singular, but it has only two pieces, a smooth piece of dimension 4n minus 6, and then a zero dimensional singular set. So here's the case when n is 2. 4n minus 6, 8 minus 6, good, it's two dimensional with a zero dimensional. Okay, so uh, so this is a this is not a hard theorem to prove, although uh, this this space itself, in, except in, except in the case when n is four, I actually don't know anything about the homeomorphism or even the homotopic type of this space. Uh, I believe it has an interesting intersection. Pairing, I believe it's the singularities. I don't even know what the what the what kind of singularities they are. They're cones on some manifold, but I don't know what that manifold is. Except here, where the singularities are cones on a circle. Okay, so uh, so now let me describe the pillowcase, which is the case of four four points. Here's the group written out explicitly, and. Um, so I claim that there's a map from R2 onto this traceless character variety for the two for the four puncture two sphere. And it takes a pair of real numbers, x and y, to the following homomorphism. It takes the first generator to i, the quaternion i and the quaternion, the second to cosine x i plus sine xj, which is, is more easily written in this form. The third to cosine y i plus sine y j. And then you can check that, uh, in fact, you can check that this is a consequence of this relation. Or if you like, you can check that this assignment satisfies this relation. You can check that, of course, the real part of all these numbers are zero. And not too, it's not too hard to check that these are exempt, that this map is surjective. Obviously, if I uh, replace x by x plus 2 pi, I get the same representation. So it certainly factors through the torus. Or I can reflect, reflect y by uh, y plus 2 pi. But there's a vial group action which corresponds to um, replacing x and y by minus x minus y. So, there's, so it's really the torus modulo an extra z2, an extra involution. It's called a hyperelliptic involution, the famous involution in a surface theory. And so if you take a torus and you have a mod out by involution, it's an involution with four fixed points, you get the four. So there, at least there's one calculation 
you know, character variety, a traceless character variety in one name. Uh, notice it's a two-manifold, so it's a symplectic manifold in particular. At least it's a symplectic orbifold. Or, uh, you can make sense of a uh, symplectic structure, but we'll just only concern ourselves with the symplectic structure. Okay, so uh, now let's suppose that I have a tangle in a three-manifold. So I have a three-manifold whose boundary is a two-sphere, and I have some collection of n properly embedded arcs in uh, the three-manifold. Here's, here's an example of this. I have, you should think of the manifold as being the outside of this ball. So we're inside the manifold looking out. Here's the boundary of this manifold. And uh, the tangle, there are two strands. If you can see, one of them is blue and one of them is uh, white and uh, black. And so um, we can look at the um, traceless character variety for the tangle itself. That is to say, I look at the representations of the fundamental group of the tangle complement to take every one of these little red meridian curves to a traceless element, and I mod out by conjugation. And that gives me some kind of algebraic variety, which in general can be quite nasty. Um, whenever you have incompressible surfaces in the complement of this tangle, it gives rise to high dimensional components. This is a philosophy that's well understood by topologists. So if you, if you do a satellite construction, for example, you get a a very nasty uh, uh, algebraic varieties in high dimensionalism, high dimensionalism life. So there's a little symbol here in this theorem. And what this symbol says is that there's a way to perturb the flatness equations by an arbitrarily small amount so that the resulting traceless character variety is just as nice as what we saw for the surfaces. It's 2n minus 3 dimensional. Notice that's half of this dimension. It has zero dimensional singularities, just like this had zero dimensional singularities. And, um, and finally, the restriction map, if you take a homomorphism of the fundamental group of the complement of a tangle, it induces one by just restricting to the fundamental group of the two-sphere, turns out to be a Lagrangian immersion, so that, that something, it's something specific. These perturbations have to be chosen carefully, consistent with the, with the, um, kind of the algebraic topology that induces the symplectic structure. And this gives you an, a Lagrangian immersion. The nasty points, the singular points, are zero-dimensional. They're sent to the zero-dimensional points. And the smooth part, 2n minus 3-dimensional part, is Lagrangianly immersed in this 4n minus 3 dimensional Yeah. Paul, can you remind us again what is R sub pi? Uh, well, I, since I didn't tell you, I can't remind you. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. I missed it. Uh, but uh, so, so I'm going to be purposely vague about this. So um, the algebraic varieties that arise in this subject tend to be singular. And algebra and, and, and you you are familiar with color shalon, so you know that incompressible surfaces give rise to make even nastier things. So you need a way to fix that. And there's a way that goes back to Donaldson and uh, Taubes and Fleur that perturb the, the analytic way to describe it is you perturb the flatness equation. Maybe I should maybe I should answer this in a more understandable way. Um, for a closed manifold, I said we're interested in the Morse homology of the Chern-Simons function. The problem is that the Chern-Simons function may not have Morse critical points. Its critical points may be, if you're lucky, Morse uh, bot, bot. If you're unlucky, they could just be horrible. And so polynomial perturbations are a standard, anal analytically convenient way to, to kick the Chern-Simons function so that it becomes Morse, and so that it's Morse theory makes sense. So I did not describe, but, the, but that's really the content of this theorem, is that one can find arbitrarily small perturbations so that the space is And you know, 
slide number 57 has the definition. So. Okay, um, there's a symplectic, you know, I, should, I shouldn't get, I don't have so little time, but I went to a talk recently by a guy who had, a, you know, sometimes you can see the number of slides in the talk, and when you get bored and you see they're only 10% done and there's five minutes left, you get nervous. But he had like a thousand pages, and what he does is he has, he, he has maybe 50 talks that he gives, and he knows, you know, if I give talk number one, I'll use page 130, 175, and yeah. So that's why I don't put the number here. You don't actually know how close. <laughs> okay, uh, so it's known that the um, character varieties of a closed surface are um, symplectic. In fact, they're projected, complex projected algebraic varieties. Uh, th these, are, these are theorems that go back uh, to using classical theorems in, uh, in algebraic geometry. In fact, uh, what the standard way to do this is to, is to identify these spaces with some algebraic uh, modular spaces. Um, but the important thing is that the symplectic structure is actually something very familiar to any topologist. It's just a cup product on, uh, on first cohomology. So symplectic structure, the fact that it's symplectic, it may be tricky, but what the symplectic form is something completely natural. And um, the reason I mention this is that the very first lemma in geometric topology that everybody knows is that if you have a manifold uh, with boundary, and you look at the cohomology of the manifold in the cohomology of its boundary, the image is always a half-dimensional subspace, a Lagrangian subspace. This is the basis of 90% of, of geometric topology. And in this case, that's the, it turns into, that fact turns into the assertion that this immersion is a, um, if I have a, a manifold with boundary a closed surface, this immersion is a Lagrangian immersion. Or this, this map is, has a Lagrangian immersion. Uh, this is for closed surfaces, and I'm interested in pairs consisting of surfaces with points in it or three manifolds with tangles. And so I have to work a little harder, and this is related to what we heard in Alexia's talk. Um, uh, so um, so I, I, I want to say that the content of the proof of this theorem here that in this traceless context, this is a Lagrangian immersion, has two steps. First, you go to the fact that for manifold, with, when there are no tangles involved, it's this, it's this well-known fact in algebraic topology. There's some, again, there's some perturbation stuff that I'm sweeping under the rug, but that's a, um, a result that's known, for example, from Chris Harrell's thesis and, 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 and even from earlier work of Taubes and, uh, and for himself. So the, um, the proof of the theorem uh, that I had up there a few minutes ago boils down to the following statement. That if I look at a tangle, for example, in this picture, let's look at the outside of tangle. So I'm considering a three manifold, which is the outside of this ball, and the tangle contained in it. I can drill out a little neighborhood of each tangle complement, and what I end up with is a three manifold whose boundary is a genus and surface. So I will start with that, and the, uh, the actual statement of our theorem in this particular case is that um, there's a moment map, there's a Hamiltonian torus action, moment map on the moduli space of the closed surface. There's a Hamiltonian uh, torus action, and if you look at the corresponding symplectic quotient, you get this traceless character variety. So it's kind of interesting that you go from the closed surface case to the punctured surface case by a symplectic reduction. And that's nice because uh, the symplectic reductions, of course, induce a symplectic structure on the base. <coughs> I've, I've explained where the symplectic form comes from. But from our purpose, the, the, the more important uh, consequence is that if you have a a Lagrangian immersion in a symplectic manifold, and it's transverse to the level set of your moment map, when you symplectically reduce, you get a, you get a Lagrangian immersion <coughs> in the symplectic reduction. And that's the, um, that's the content of, that, that's in fact uh, why this theorem is true. The fact that this is a, uh, the 
Lagrangian immersion comes from the fact for manifolds with no tangles and closed boundary, symplectically reduced. And is it easy to see Hamiltonians with generated torus action? Uh, I would ask your advisor, and then I would read his paper, and then so I would. So there's a trace function. Yes, that's right. Yeah. So, so this, so yeah. So this, the, the, this relies heavily on Goldman's work uh, about how to how to understand the symplectic form concretely on the moduli space of a closed surface. But that's just trace function around, around the uh, meridian. Well, yeah, that's what I would think. But meridian trace functions are zero, I thought. Uh, uh, no. Uh, well. Yeah. So the moment map is the trace around the meridian, just as he says. Don't we assume that all traces are meridians are zero? Well, on the on the full moduli space of the closed surface, they are not. And the level set of the moment map then is all the trace, all the representations of the closed surface that are traceless. But then there's those are counted too much, so I need to mod out by the torus action okay. to get. It. No. Okay. Um, Okay, so that's that was the surface case. So now let me let me just switch gears. I don't know, probably used up most of my time. So I'm doing okay. So that was a, a, a one aspect of, of the theory. So now I want to just give you some examples rather than try to explain uh, what we're trying to do. And maybe I will introduce really my uh, my ideas with pictures. So let's start with this uh, very simple case of the un two stranded un in a three ball. Now, I'm going to do two things to it. I'm going to put an earring. So this little symbol, the natural musical symbol, is a, is a replacement uh, thing where you give it a tangle, you produce a new tangle with an extra closed component, which is just put a little earring on one component. Uh, for those of you who know a little bit about Coban homology, this is the counterpart of, of the transition from Coburn homology to reduced Coburn homology. You remember that, how do you define reduced Coburn homology? You pick a strand in your knot diagram and you put a dot in it. So I'm going to take the dot that uh, Coburn gives me and put just a little gear in there instead. From the point of view of the gauge theory, what is actually happening is that I'm creating some H2. That H2, so, so there's a little torus that's the boundary of the tubular neighborhood. That torus is, is homologically essential. That enables me to produce a non-trivial SO3 bundle. And non-trivial SO3 bundles enable us to, uh, to avoid certain orbit singularities in the space of connections mod gauge transformation. So this is a, an innocuous, perhaps an innocent looking thing. Given a knot or a link, add a little earring to it. But it, it, it immediately eliminates half the problem with singularities in this topic. And it has a direct connection to Coburn homology, in this case to reduce Coburn homology. The red curve is, again, what I'm not explaining. This is a, um, a holonomy perturbation. This is a Wilson loop. So I'm going to perturb the Morse function by uh, taking the holonomy of my connection around this loop and taking the trace. That's the value. That's how I perturb the trim science function. So this comes into play in that. So the red thing should meet the, the No, it's, it's linking. No, it should, does not work. <coughs> but let me say that what it's doing is that it's cutting through. There's an incompressible disk here. And so it's killing the incompressible <coughs> disk. So there's a connection between sort of classical things in three manifold incompressible surfaces. And as I said, those are the things that make the churn simons function not Morse. And so this Wilson loop was chosen to turn it into a Morse. So you ask the holonomy along the rod, the red thing to be non-trivial or something? I take I take the churn simons function and I add to it the following function. So the function is a function that's supposed to take a connection and give me a real number. What is so you give me a connection, what real number do I give you? The trace of the holonomy around this red loop. And that's, if you remember the Wilson lines in Witten's paper, that's exactly what he calls it. That's the, you know, the, the function whose expectation he counts when he's, when he's constructing the uh, Okay, so, uh, so here's a theorem. I, I can't tell you how much work it was just to get this stupid trivial theorem for this, for the most trivial of all tangles in the world. 
But uh, if, you, if you perturb this appropriately, you get a smooth manifold, and it immerses in this way in the pellet, in the peripheries. These character varieties are very hard to get your hands on sometime, but I will give you some pictures. Of them. So this, this was the first theorem that we kind of stumbled on when we were doing this, and, and it had many interesting consequences for calculations of instant homology and that kind of thing. Let me give you a, now a more substantial example. So I've drawn for you here a torus knot, a tangled decomposition of a torus knot. So how should you see that? First, ignore all the black and look at just the red. This is a hot flink, which I want to do uh, Dane surgery on. So I have this component and this component. I'm going to do Q over R, Dane surgery on this component, minus S over P, Dane surgery, where PQR is satisfied with some constraints. And it's very easy to see that the result is a three sphere. So if the black weren't there, you get the three sphere. But now, throw in the black, you can see that this is, becomes, when you do the surgery, this unknot becomes the PQ torus knot of the three sphere. So this is kind of an interesting tangled decomposition of the three sphere. It corresponds roughly to the fact, you, everybody here is probably familiar with the, fact, the way you build a torus knot by gluing two solid tori together along an annulus. What's happening here is by removing this little ball, what I get outside that ball is the same thing as if I glue two solid tori, not along an annulus, but along a little square, like half the annulus. And then I get this, uh, this is a picture of it. Okay, so I get this decomposition of the three sphere along into two three balls. Um, and it, this decomposition takes the PQ torus knot into two pieces. One is this unknotted piece that we just analyzed in the previous slide, and the other is some tangle, some complicated tangle that I, I won't bother to draw. You know, you can think about what would happen if you glue these down and, and, and saw what the real picture is, but it's very difficult to draw a picture. This is kind of an efficient picture. So here's an example of what you get. And I've applied that to the case of the 3 4 torus knot. So here's the 3 4 torus knot, in case you're not familiar with it. But I want to take a particular tangled decomposition, which I haven't illustrated. And when you do this, you see that the character variety coming from one piece in this decomposition is the singular one manifold. It's a, it's a theta curve that has a uh, an arc and then a circle kind of meeting in two points. And it, how does that map to this pillow case, which I'm representing now this way? It turns out that it maps in this, in this particular way. Uh, there's, there's, it's kind of interesting that it's linear and it took us a long time to, to come to grips with that. Okay. So, I have described for you, if you go back two slides, I have a decomposition of the torus knot. One uh, piece is a trivial two tangle. And um, it gives rise to a circle. So this piece here is a circle. And the immersion, this map, is this figure eight immersion. The other side. is this theta curve. And the immersion, well, it's not quite a manifold, but anyway, I've described for you this immersion. This blue line goes here. This top arc goes to this red arc. And in fact, the bottom arc goes to the same red arc. So it's two to one generically above the red arc, and it's one to one over the blue. OK, now comes holonomic perturbations. Again, I have not, I've only hinted at what that means, but you're supposed to do something, according to my theorem, there should be arbitrarily small perturbations that smooth this manifold. And in fact, there are, they're, they're easy to find, and here's how the smoothing happens. It actually turns into, you know, the, the same old, uh, you know, I guess it's called a smoothing, right? And not in, in not really And so this immersion turns into now honest to God Lagrangian immersion of this manifold, this long, green arc gets mapped this way, and the blue circle gets mapped, wrapped twice around. 
There's an, in, an interesting reason why it goes twice. It's, it's related to something, related to the fact that these are not just Lagrangian immersions, but they're exact or uh, exact Lagrangian immersions in a certain sense. So it's horrible. Could you go still, you still go to the singular point or not? Is this a uh, only the point? end point. So the theorem said that the singular points of this go to the singular point and the smooth points go to the interior. But before you avoid it, uh, for you. you yeah, know, okay, the brown curve missed the singular point. Yeah. But here you cannot do that. Here you cannot. And it has to do with the fact that if you put an earring, I, I skipped this step in the interest of time, but if you put an earring, in fact, the result will have no singularities at all. And so I put the earring inside the, the trivial knot case, mm -hmm. and it gave me a nice smooth circle that immersed into, away from the singular point. But I don't want to put two earrings. I, I mean, perhaps maybe there's a version. Again, I have in the back of my mind a connection of Kovanov homology. Maybe there's a version That's where you fine. put dots on, on all the components. Okay, so here's the here's the so here, if you like, is like my first slide, my first mysterious slide. But perhaps the picture is a little clearer to you. It's a different knot. In this case, I look at the intersections and I find that there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Um, generators, which by the way is the determinant of this knot, or the value of the Jones polynomial at whatever, value of the polynomial at minus one, let's say. And uh, there's a Z4 grading, which I definitely won't explain because it's related to a sort of index calculation, index of or spectral invariant of, of three manifold. But it can be computed combinatorially from this picture. So there's a recipe that tells me exactly where to put each of these generators mod 4. And the recipe is purely combinatorial, although we have to prove that this is correct. And in this case, there's a bygone. You can see that this, this shaded region gives me a bygone, one of whose corners is x1 minus, one of whose corners is. This is silly notation, but there's a reason for it. And so, um, so you see the chain complex has rank 7. But the homology has rank five because there's one non-trivial differential, and it turns out that it's, uh, it's the resulting homology is isomorphic to Kovanov's homology of this of this knot, and and also the instant time homology. So the bygones in the pillowcase, the Lagrangian Firth theory, seems to be capturing the same information that instant time. On the other hand, it's much easier to deal with, and so um, let's see. I have other pictures. Maybe I, I won't. Maybe I'll just show them to you quickly to indicate that there's a there's a calculus of this topic, which reminds me anyway a lot. If, if anyone here has ever calculated with Hagar Firth theory, where you <coughs> take Hagar decompositions and you have these alphas and beta curves and you look where they intersect, there's a there's a very similar flavor to this. It's not the same thing because. This has nothing to do with Hagar splitting. This has to do with character varieties. So there's this intermediate step. You go from the manifold to its flat moduli space, and then you draw these space. But still, there's a, there's a similar type of calculation. OK, so let me then try to get back on track. Let's see how I'm doing. Um, very short on time. So let me try to outline maybe how I might try to define an invariant, at least for two tangled decomposition. So I'll take a knot, um, I'll uh, add an earring, I'll take a little ball that meets it in a trivial tangle that contains the earring. I will uh, look at the character varieties. Um, here I put two n, but maybe if I'm talking about two tangles, this should, have just, this should just be four points. The goal is to define a Z4 graded Lagrangian floor theory, that is to say, to find a chain complex whose um, generators is the intersection of this universal figure eight brown curve with whatever the green curves I get from my knot. Prove it's an invariant of the manifold, maybe long term uh, show that it's related to um, instant time homology. This would be a version of some collection of problems called the, the Tia Fleur conjecture. And then uh, prove some scaling exact sequences, and maybe I will eventually skip to this to show you that there is a, an actual connection to quantum, top level quantum field theory. 
and then calculate, and, and of course the calculations are very a lot of fun. So um, for the for the pillowcase for two tangles, it turns out that one can do this in a purely undergraduate level mathematics way. Uh, you don't need the Gromov's theory of homomorphic disks, J homomorphic disks in your modular spaces. You can do it entirely in terms of immersions of, of, of disks in the pillowcase. And you get a lot more uh, structure that you don't see in the instanton theory. You have a certain uh, A affinity structure on the Fukaya category. So bygones were giving us differentials, but you can look at polygons, you can look at triangles, five gons, and these give rise to a very complicated algebraic setup. Uh, which uh, can be used to, to produce things like exact sequences. In particular, that structure is what gives us a, a connection to um, common plural nine groups. And then there's a grading issue, a Z4 grading issue, which is also kind of interesting. It can be understood in terms of certain Maslow indices uh, things that you can calculate by, by examining. So, uh, so I can't do justice to the precise statement of the result, but here's an example of, of a theorem. Maybe I'll just let you read it. If, uh, and I, won't, uh, I won't say more. But we have a proposed definition. It's, it seems to be independent of the tangle decomposition, although I don't know the proof of that fact. It seems to be... Um, independent of the perturbation, if the perturbation is needed, although at this point I don't know how to prove that fact. And um, in every case, it, it gives us the same answer that Hagar first not Molly gives us more that instant time. Not so I feel that we're on the right track in producing it. But it has a virtue that there are no PDEs, and well, that's a good thing. Okay. So maybe I will rush through the last few slides by mentioning how you might get a skein exact triangle. So here's our here's the here's here's the picture that should appear in every talk in this conference. It is my version of it. I'm going to put a little earring on it. Uh, I've got my three ways of replacing. Uh, these are all three trivial tangles, but somehow. Perhaps a way to think of it is it's all the same trivial tangle, but I, I'm gluing it in by three different homomorphisms. Perhaps that's a more, less confusing way to understand it. And so, um, so the conjecture is that uh, there's a special sequence that starts at Copen homology, the reduced Copen homology, and converges to this homology that I, I propose exists. And when you use this, um, this Fukaya A affinity structure, it turns out that to prove something like this, or at least to prove a scaling, uh, so to prove this theorem, if there's an exact triangle that corresponds to the theory associated with plugging this in the link versus plugging this and plugging this, it boils down to just a really simple picture. So a few minutes ago, I had a picture in the pillowcase of a figure eight. Here I've taken the two sphere and spread it out on the plane, so just so I can see it a little better. And I had a brown curve that was green in this picture, I'm sorry about that. But it turns out if I glue in, the, if I look at the three ways of gluing in my skein uh, tangle, one of the brown curves, well, here's the one I'll get from, from, the, the, from the standard way. The other two ways will give me these three curves here. And it turns out there are three triangles, uh, J homomorphic triangles, or more elementarily, there are three immersed triangles that correspond to these three points and that give rise to this. Um, this uh, a three product on, on, on the category, and um, and the fact that there are two triangles is um, is exactly the condition needed to prove uh, to sort of plug in into a machine of Seidel and Abu Zaidi. It says that um, these this triple of Lagrangians form what's called a an exact triple in the Fukaya category. And that has a consequence that no matter what variable I put in here, the resulting Lagrangian Fleur theory will give me an exact long-tax sequence. So this is the proof. This picture in the pillowcase 
is the, together with the evaluation of how the three different homeomorphisms that glue in the tangle in the three different ways give rise to act on the pillowcase. This is the proof that, that there is a scan exact triangle. We're not quite done yet proving there's a spectral sequence from the homology, but this is sort of the main ingredient in such. Okay, and then I think I'm out of time, so I'm just going to take my remaining X minutes and divide by the remaining N slides. You can just read them. Oh, Adam, read quickly. Okay, got it? There was a typo there. Okay. Um, okay. Okay, thank you. Hermitian symplectic manifold. The Lagrangians are like Hermitian Lagrangian, and I think the analysis of the Lagrangian field series, at least I'm not familiar with such things, though I know people think about such things. But conversely, though, um, you'll see that really what I was talking about is closely related to the A polynomials, so that when I have four um, points, that this pillowcase is really the real points in A. In the character variety for torus, in fact, there's a twofold branch cover connection between them. And so these things, the, the curves that I'm drawing are, are analogs of the A polynomial. And so all that work, you know, tends to make one want to ask that question. But I don't know. Okay, I don't know what are the equations for the pivot case. What, what does this mean? You mean how did I? No, it's an algebraic variety that a product can be given by whatever number of uh, yeah, uh, Yes. Um, <laughs> well, okay, so it's how about I take a flat torus and I mod out by the hyperelliptic involution. So I could take the, the coordinate ring of the torus mm -hmm. and look at the invariant subring given by, you know, xy goes to minus x minus y. Mark of x squared plus y squared plus z squared plus x y z equals four over one i. This is a mark equation. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, yeah. Um, yeah. So I I saw that in a paper of Goldman, and maybe it's a well-known thing, but in Goldman he has an explicit. Yeah. yeah. So you never take if I take two different polynomials. I don't want you to define monomial categories. Yeah. But if I take two different ones, what can I say about the two Lagrangians? I guess. Um, they're exact Lagrangian cohort. There should be enough to get the same. Uh, there is enough. Uh, I don't, I, you know, that's the next three years of my life to be spent thinking about that question. Um, it's, in general, it's not true that arbitrary Lagrangian cohortisms be. That's exact ones. Even even that, I don't think it, or it's I don't think it's true that, or I don't know the extent to which symplectic field theorists or people like I know uh, exactly how invariant um, the Grangian four theories are with respect to concordance. I mean, this is, first of all, most of the theory that's out there has to do with embedded Lagrangians. These these are immersed, so there's already a subtlety to deal with that, and then now immersed and cobordisms. Uh, um, Except, the only thing I can say is that I've calculated as many ways and I always get the same thing too. So it's true. Okay, that's all. Thank you.